looking at a conference, who is, who is it for? Um, then um, uh, yeah, I was trying to explain who Jean was. And, um, and then uh, I got the answer that, uh, you know, the, the, the description, the question was, ah, c'est le beau gosse qui ressemble à Jacques Dutron. So, um, and then I said, yes. So I, then of course I found uh, for, for the younger people who, who don't know uh, Jacques Dutron so well and particularly Jacques Dutron when he was younger, I just want to, you know, show a quick photo of Jacques Dutron, which is uh, this one, uh, which uh, is one reason for which the poor Jean probably got uh, uh, reminded many times uh, that he was, uh, uh, that Jacques Dutron was a lookalike of him. Uh, anyway, so, um, so that was the way uh, somehow we, we, when I met Jean, that was sort of the, the, one of the characteristics, but um, my interaction with Jean, of course, was uh, had in some sense. I, we, it's fair to say two 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 phases uh, during which we interacted more. The first one was the the, the my old days in Jussieu as a PhD student and young young CNRS researcher, and now most recently in the last uh, seven years uh, in Zurich, where we meet. Uh, and interact frequently both for uh, organizational matters and then uh, post uh, seminar dinners and uh, more informal uh, settings. And of course, uh, I mean, as all of you know, Jean is just a very, very uh, mm -hmm. enjoyable person uh, to, to interact with, an ideal colleague who's never, you know, he's always remains calm and is efficient and reliable on all matters. So. Uh, it's it's wonderful and also he's so very good at uh, with his students and uh, his presentations are always uh, uh, wonderful and also uh, you know nowadays with these uh, awful uh, zoom things we don't get to see it that much but probably all of you remember then he has a very nice handwriting on the blackboard <laughs> and so that's part of the this classy style when he you know gives a lecture uh, is also the the very nice uh, handwriting uh, with with the chalk uh, but when i was thinking about uh, you know my interaction with jean uh, i think it's probably the rule of the game uh, the the first thing that comes to mind is sort of rem re you know reminiscence from these old days from this very, uh, you know, my my own uh, first steps within the uh, uh, mathematics lab, which was the Laboratoire de Probabilité back then. And so I had some sort of, uh, you know, reminiscences. And so I remembered like, you know, probability, doing probability in the Laboratoire was a very cozy affair. It was very, very, just very nice. There was, I didn't feel, you know, much stress. Uh, things were, you know, uh, uh, also local, much less, uh, you know, global than they are today. So everything was going on just there. So I remember the corridor and all these uh, very, very interesting characters that were populating the, the lab there. And uh, that, so the lab also, which extended beyond the corridor. And um, I very remember, you know, the interaction with Jean when we were discussing on, on the couple of little papers we wrote together back then. Um, yeah, so then, you know, in those days, um, everybody was sharing offices. So uh, Annie Millet and Sylvie Melea were uh, sharing their office with, uh, with Jean. Uh, and uh, it wasn't a problem. It was a very convenient office also because I very much remember that it was located uh, quite close to the, to, 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 to the famous toilets. So when you needed uh, the key to the toilets, uh, that was a very good uh, place to stop uh, if you didn't have the key in your pocket because uh, there was this um, drawer uh, in which the key was. Um, anyway, so so the very, very uh, nice and fond memories from then. And um, of course, he, he is slightly older than me. So, um, you know, for me, he was always the, the more established person. So he was the CNRS, uh, the young CNRS, who then quickly got promoted professor in, in, in became professor in, in Jussieu. Um, and uh, I think one of my, probably one of the things I share with Jean, and I can see it when I go each time, I'm reminded of that each time I go into his office in, in Zurich, is of course the, the fact that we don't forget uh, 
Mark, Mark Yor, uh, who has, you know, obviously his, we all wished uh, he would be uh, also here uh, celebrating Jean's uh, career. I, I, I always noticed that their, you know, their interaction was always that of a lot of mutual respect and uh, affection. Uh, and um, yeah, and of course, uh, this, uh, both our, you know, careers, that's somehow where we come from. Uh, remember the working groups with Mark and uh, in those days, it was, you know, the days of the uh, Pittman, your summer papers where uh, Mark would go to, 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 to Berkeley uh, in, in, in each summer and then we one had to wait what, uh, you know, what would come out of, of that uh, interaction uh, between the two. And the other thing is, I very much remember that the first paper by, by Jean that I read uh, is also a good thing to mention here because it sort of uh, gives a little snapshot of what probability theory was like and what, our, what it was like to be there uh, at those days and also allows to mention <laughs> Azema, so, which was one of these interesting characters uh, of the Laboratoire de Probabilité, which, so this is sort of a small uh, short paper, which is about constructing the V processes using Azema's martingale. And I write down here the little um, uh, abstract down there. Um, and uh, this is sort of part of the general game that was uh, we like to play, and uh, everybody like many people like to play in those games, which was you know to construct, relate certain uh, processes to other processes, con being able to construct a process X out of a process Y by some uh, clever mechanism. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, and of course these are having sort of slightly exotic uh, objects such as the Azema martingale. So that's just a reminiscent of uh, where, where somehow, you know, the roots of uh, Jean's uh, maths come from and uh, what he has then, you know, used uh, and moved on to develop. And so back then, I think it's fair to say that uh, the, the, the one of the, the games was to have find pathwise explanation of identities in laws between functionals of say Brown in motion or Bessel processes was really one of the, the, the main goals. And um, so I'll just uh, mention the Cieselski, you know, finding the right sample path transformation explains Cieselski Taylor identities was sort of one of the, 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 the key, you know, one of the questions that were around. So maybe for those who, who don't know that, uh, let me just uh, very quickly remind you this problem. I mean, one reason I'm flashing this out is just because I think that's as partly still open question, which is that, so here, this is an extract from the, the lecture notes of uh, Mark in Mark Yor in Zurich, which is to say that, you know, if you take a delta dimensional process and you take its hitting time of one, so delta being positive, uh, that has a certain distribution that one can compute. And if you take a delta plus two dimensional Bessel process, that because delta plus two is greater than two, it goes all the way to infinity. So it's, it only spends a finite amount of time under the level one. And if you look at about what this finite amount of time is, it turns out that it has the same distribution that they take time of one by Bessel process of dimension delta. And um, as Mark writes here, you know, except in the case delta equals one, which is a relation between Bessel one and Bessel three, there is no path decomposition explanation uh, of this identity. As far as I know, this is still, uh, you know, we still don't know how to do that. Just in the case delta equal one and delta equal th uh, three, you know, the, 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 the way you, you do that is you have a reflected Brownian motion up to its hitting time of one on the one hand side. On the other side, you have a three dimensional process, Bessel process that goes all the way to infinity. Right, then you, you chop up everything that is above the level one. So you take all this away. And now if you take the last time at which you are at one and you look backwards and you flip the entire picture, you get exactly the brown emotion uh, up to the, you know, you, like this reflected near here and then all the way goes to uh, distance one from where it started. So you get exactly this sort of pathwise uh, explanation of, of this identity. And so that was a little bit, you know, the type of um, 
of things that uh, were around uh, and that we like to do. Uh, and there were lots of papers by Jean about you know, decomposing uh, this and that type of process uh, above the this future minimum and uh, you know, var variants of uh, results by uh, Pittman and, uh, and uh, others. Um, and um, uh, so that was, you know, one one type of uh, game we we one like to play. Uh, another uh, game uh, that I think Jean uh, enjoyed and uh, that uh, sort of, in some sense, uh, also was sort of was going into the pushing him then later into the direction of Levy process, I would imagine which is that, uh, you know, the type of questions which has to do with the fact that when you take a Brownian motion or Bessel process, uh, it's more interesting when the dimension is, the Bessel process is actually smaller than one, whether you can make sense of this process, which would be the integral of uh, DS over BS. And uh, for those of you who don't know these very classical old uh, stuff, uh, you know, the, the general idea is that if you look at one Brownian excursion, it's not a problem to make sense of the integral of ds over the value of the Brownian excursion, just for scaling reason, near zero things don't go, uh, don't, you know, don't blow up too badly. Uh, but then you have lots of very small Brownian excursion, and then the contribution, you know, the scaling goes wrong uh, when you look at, you know, you add up the values of uh, ds over bs for each of the Brownian excursion, it's sort of, you have a problem, so you have to do some sort of a uh, you know, uh, make sense of this integral in a, you know, uh, stochastic sense, you know, the sum of the plus and the minuses somehow compensate, even if the sum of all the ds over absolute value of bs don't make much sense. And uh, here I just maybe can flash, uh, you know, this paper by, by Jean, you know, the old papers of 1990, which is exactly this type of uh, story that you look at a better process of dimension d smaller than one, and then uh, what happens is that, you know, in order to make sense of this uh, uh, integral uh, of uh, one over X uh, DS, you have to use sort of this idea of a partie fini or, or principal value of, uh, of the integral of one DS over XS. So that's if uh, you take a, a, a better process of dimension strictly smaller than one and you can, you know, uh, make sense of these uh, fun processes. And in those days, you know, it was fun because it was also, you know, type of processes that uh, went out of the realm of usual stochastic calculus where you don't get some Martin gills, but something you can still, uh, you know, play with as a probabilist using uh, Levy compensation ideas. Um, then Jean has moved on to, to some, um, uh, uh, you know, developing uh, lots of things uh, about Levy processes and also the relation between Levy processes and branching coalescent structures. Uh, and, uh, you know, alongside uh, others uh, has, uh, you know, used somehow the, the, the jumps of Levy processes in a reliable and clever and elegant way in order to, to be able to understand lots of other type of probabilistic objects that involve a one dimensional, uh, you know, uh, time uh, evolution. And so he has first introduced a self similar fragmentation. So I think that's in, in the paper, which I, is probably here. Uh, right. So this is this paper uh, 2002 on self similar fragmentation. And then later on, he has uh, introduced, uh, you know, the self similar growth fragmentation processes where, you know, the, the you have both sort of a fragmentation uh, phenomenon, uh, you know, that uh, involves, you know, subtle, uh, you know, infinite infinitesimal fragments and, uh, you know, Levy processes type dislocations. Uh, and also a growth mechanism, you know, the, where, where the, you know, the sizes of the samples could also, you know, grow or have positive jumps. And I, re I remember then, that's sort of actually not so old uh, stuff, these growth fragmentation process. And I, I very much remember that I had this, you know, the, the reaction that said, ah, oh, this is a, you know, when I heard him presenting things, this is a nice object again, maybe a bit artificial because I had no idea, you know, I thought, you know, why would, you know, could a process, I under, you know, the idea of having something that fragments on its own, that looks, you know, uh, something natural, but then, uh, you know, that has positive jumps, uh, 
you know, whether the masses could, you know, have positive jumps. I felt, you know, how could this possibly, you know, really show up in real life? And as always in these things and the similar type of things uh, about uh, many things that, you know, Brown and meanders and other, you know, objects that uh, were, you know, very uh, much, you know, stochastic calculus, laboratoire probability type objects. Uh, I, you know, I quickly, it quickly turned out that they were actually central and very useful uh, for uh, all the things that I was actually studying uh, in the two-dimensional setting. So the goal of the, this talk, or maybe the remainder of this talk, because, you know, time is moving fast, is uh, to, to give you a little glimpse to, of uh, three uh, instances where you could see either uh, some of the ideas that did arise in the two-dimensional setting as, uh, in some sense, natural uh, reincarnation or prolongate, you know, uh, generalizations of um, these one-dimensional questions, and uh, or, or direct use of these uh, objects, uh, some of the objects I just mentioned before, uh, in these two-dimensional uh, random settings. So, of course. Um, so I want to mention very briefly loop soups, ray night theorems, and pathwise identities. Most of what I want to explain would have to do maybe with conformal loop ensemble and principal values. And uh, I'll just mention why sort of the, the growth fragmentations have to are uh, sort of crucial in the uh, stories about principal values. So here my target audience is, you know, I'm aware, I assume that everybody here is sort of uh, related to Jean's mathematics and uh, not everybody. So probably most of the audience knows much better, you know, much better than I do uh, a lot of the actual things having to do maybe with principal values of brown emotion or uh, uh, growth fragmentation processes a la Jean. Um, but uh, I don't assume, I, I sort of want to give you a little overview without any definition, so a bit impressionistic uh, to how these things appear in the two-dimensional setting, but it's really targeted for non-specialists of this two-dimensional world. So I apologize for, uh, I mean, if Scott Sheffield is listening to this, he will uh, uh, <laughs> uh, not learn much, of course, or very little from what I'm saying here. Okay, so my, my first Little remark is has to do with these Brownian loop soup stories that have you know emerged. Uh, uh, I think the paper on loop soups that we wrote with Greg was probably two thousand three or two thousand four, and then uh, you know has a, uh, turned out to be a, a useful tool uh, in the two dimensional setting. So maybe I'll, I'll just very briefly draw a couple of pictures here, and I hope the, the everything will work uh, okay. So um, the Brownian loop soup is something you can define in any, uh, in any setting. So either the cable graphs or d-dimensional setting. So let me do it in the two-dimensional, you know, usual two-dimensional setting, which would be like, you know, you have a domain, could be the upper half plane or a disk here. And in this domain, there is a natural, very natural measure that you can define, which is a measure on Brownian closed Brownian loops with non-specified length uh, uh, in the, that stay in this, in, this, uh, in this domain, right? So it's a measure mu, it's a measure on loops and it's very natural and easy to define just out of Brownian motion. And, um, and it's the important thing you have to, that I want to stress is that this is a measure on Brownian loops that don't have you know, it's up to circular time reparameterization. So it doesn't have an a priori given starting point or end point or root of the loop, like you want to say, it's really just the loop itself, right? So the, the random object is just this, uh, this, this picture. And there are two variants, you know, you can either decide that the loop still has no starting point, but an orientation. So, you know, that, that would be an oriented loop. It goes this way or, uh, you could decide that it is unoriented so that the loop has not, you know, you, you haven't chosen whether you go it in one, di in one direction or the other. 
So in some sense, it's uh, something parameterized, or you know, from the unit circle in the in the in the disk, but then modulo either you know mod you know increasing time reparameterization or you know uh, or uh, you know uh, non increasing. You allow also non increasing uh, bijections from the circle onto itself. Okay, so that's uh, the the first natural object, and then uh, what the loop soup is is nothing else than uh, uh, having a, what we, you know, a Poisson point process of loops that do fall here with intensity mu or constant, some constant time mu. And then it turns out, and I, you know, long, short, long story short, that there are two very natural uh, loop soups, uh, two very natural values of uh, C that you can play with. And one of which has to do with the fact that um, if you take the loops to be oriented, then the natural loop soup that you're, you know, so these are, you know, collections of loops that fall in, into that domain, uh, a Poisson point process with those intensities, C times mu, so you have a countable collection of loops. This measure puts an infinite mass on very small loops, so you have very small loops everywhere, and they are oriented, so that would be the, the loop soup with intensity mu, and if you don't take the loop oriented, and if you decide that the loops are, are just unoriented loops, then the more natural loop soup to consider for reasons I don't want to enter to explain here is the one with half the intensity of the previous one, which is just having to do with the fact that uh, uh, you take a, uh, you know, the Poisson point process of intensity is half of what it is over there. No, I just want to, so then, you know, as uh, shown by uh, Lejean and Lupu and uh, uh, been used by many others since, um, if you take uh, this one here, right, you have this Poisson point process of loops. And if you do uh, apply uh, the, if you look at the suitably renormalized occupation time field by this Poisson point process of loops. So in some sense, if I take a domain, subdomain D here, you look the total amount of time spent by all the loops in this portion of, uh, in, this, in this piece here, you can relate that directly to what is called, to this sort of square of a Gaussian free field. And that's also related to uh, Nathalie, uh, the stories Nathalie was uh, discussing uh, uh, in her talk. And um, so there's sort of this direct relation between, uh, you know, Ga uh, Gaussian free field, square of Gaussian free field and, and loop soup occupation times. And of course, the occupation time of this one, which is the square or, you know, uh, given by the, the sum of two independent copies of the previous one, because it's a Poisson pro process of point process of intensity mu is just the sum of two independent Poisson point process of intensity mu over two. Uh, you know, can be constructed, so that would be the sum of two squares of Gaussian free field occupation times. The other thing is that the, 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 the one with oriented loops that I did draw up there is very much related to Wilson's algorithm and loop erase random walk in the sense that, uh, you know, if I draw, if I pick a point here, uh, I draw what we like to call an SLE2. So this is like the scaling limit of a loop erased random walk which you could view as a loop erased Brownian motion in some sense. And then you have an independent loop soup here with that intensity, it's, or it's an oriented one. Then if you move along the, the, the loop erased random walk and you attach to the curve along the way you're going all the loops, the, the loops that in the loop soup that it encounters uh, in chronological order and using its orientation, you get exactly the law of a Brownian path. So in some sense, it's sort of the, the reverse, the, the loops that show up here are exactly the loops that, that you raised in uh, when you perform somehow the scaling limit of Wilson's algorithm to construct uh, uniform spanning trees. Um, and uh, so there is this sort of a story behind. And this, you know, if you look at the picture in one dimension, if you look at the picture in one, so what I claim is that all the results I uh, explained to you before are really reincarnations or in two dimensions of 
the Ray Knight theorems on the one hand, and these some of these uh, pathwise transformations uh, that we are playing with, uh, we like to play. And the reason is just the following: when you look at, say, you take a, a, a three-dimensional Bessel process, say, up to its hitting time of one. Then you look at the, you know, the excursion above the future infimum of this object here, right? What is an excursion in one dimension, right? It's a path that starts from a point here and ends at this point, this very point here. And this point is just the lowest point of shores of the, 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 the trajectories. So you can really view an excursion as nothing ends at the one dimensional loop, right? It goes up and it goes down again. So these objects that appear here are really loops uh, with chosen mark point, which is the lowest point in the, in the decomposition that you have here. So if you look at this picture here, the time you takes up to, to go up to one, to the take time of one here is nothing else than the sum of all uh, the time lengths of a one dimensional loop soup in the interval zero one. Okay, so that's just a little, you know, illustration of that. And of course, the square of the Gaussian free field that I had here in the one dimensional case, the Gaussian free field is nothing else than a, a, a Brownian uh, bridge or a Brownian uh, loop. And uh, so the square would be like a square Bessel of dimension one. And then here you get the sum of two square Bessel of dimension one, which is a square of dimension two. Uh, and here we are with the Rayni theorems over there. So a lot of the, you know, these uh, pathwise decompositions and the decomposition above past minima or future, uh, past maximum or future max minimum of processes are actually, you know, can be reinterpreted in terms of uh, loops, uh, loop soups, and also uh, the pathwise transformations are, you know, type verva type can be viewed as, you know, different ways to discover uh, the uh, loops from different uh, points in the, from different sides and this type of thing. So I don't want to spend much time except that, you know, insist on the fact that uh, indeed uh, the loop soups themselves and uh, the stories about the occupation times was, can be viewed as some sort of a, you know, two dimensional or higher dimensional incarnation of uh, the Ray Knight theorems and some of the pathwise transformation that we uh, enjoyed playing with. Now, uh, as I said, the, the, my, my main goal is to say a few words uh, about uh, the Gaussian free field in two dimensions, the exploration, the level lines, and their, uh, the, what I want to describe as the exploration paths. And again, uh, I'm going to use, uh, try to use the, my uh, blackboard, uh, <laughs> which is here, and um, uh, try to uh, uh, give you some, you know, heuristics about going what's what is going on here. So the first first remark I want to make is um, what the Gaussian free field is. So the Gaussian free field, if you draw it in two dimensions, you have to take it in a domain, which is could be the half plane or the unit disk. So let's do it in a uni unit disk. And it is you take it with boundary value zero. That's the one which is uh, simplest to start with. Um, and that's uh, going to be the somehow the continuous, I mean, the, the two dimensional analog of the Brownian bridge that you can draw here and the Brownian bridge. So you replace now the, the object in, that you're looking at is the interval here. You are at zero here, you are at zero there. And here, as we know, we have the Brownian bridge, which is sort of the natural random function with boundary value zero and zero on the sub, side of this interval. And the Gaussian free field is in some sense, the general, you know, the, the two dimensional analog of uh, here, the random function with boundary value zeros on the boundary of the interval, except that it is the random function with boundary value zero uh, defined in the unit disk. And you have this function, which is now defined in the unit disk. And of course, the Gaussian free field, in some sense, is a scary object for those of us who liked, who were attracted to Brownian motion and stochastic calculus and these sorts of things, because it was, you know, a crazy continuous uh, function. That's what the Brownian motion is, uh, with with various weird properties. And but still, it's continuous, so it's a familiar object. 
what the Gaussian free field is uh, in two dimensions and higher is that it's not a continuous function anymore. It's just a generalized function, right? So it's some object that is, you know, plus infinity and minus infinity everywhere. But you can still make sense of, you know, this sort of the mean value of the field on, uh, say, for instance, a small piece here. So it's really something where these compensation of lots of plus and minus infinity comes into the game in a even wilder way than the one we you know, might be used to. Now, the important feature of the Gaussian free field in high dimension is that the, it has a conformal Markov property. So in the two dimensions, you know, the usual way in one dimension, the usual way you do it is, you know, you discover the, the portion here on the left of the Brownian bridge, you discover a, a portion on the right of the Brownian bridge. What is the conditional distribution of what you you know what the remaining piece and it's elementary to see that the uh, you know conditional distribution is just a Brownian bridge from here to there during that time interval uh, and one way to view it is to say that it is the sum of you know this linear function that we have here and a, and the Brownian bridge uh, from zero to zero in the remaining time interval and here the Gaussian free field in that in that uh, case here the the this, you have the similar feature, which is that if you discover the Gaussian free field up to there, what is the conditional distribution of the Gaussian free field in the remaining to be discovered domain here? Well, it turns out to be the sum of a Gaussian free field with zero boundary conditions here. So that would be like the, 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 um, the Brownian bridge there plus what, so what replaces this blue line now is a harmonic function Oh, I can see that I have a battery problem. Just a second. Uh, yeah. Oh no, I don't have a battery problem. Sorry. Um, so uh, the sum with a um, with a harmonic function that sort of extends in this domain here the values of the GFF that you observed on the uh, boundary of the domain so far. So this really corresponds to the, the linear function that is here, which is that also the harmonic function that extends uh, the GFF uh, before. Okay, so that's the, 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 the Gaussian free field. Now, even though this is not something we, you know, we like, which is to do that much in the in the context of uh, at first when you discover the the, the GFF, uh, uh, which is that um, I'm sort of worrying that something. Why is it always showing me something about the battery? Anyway. Uh, Sorry, I just uh, want to avoid having a battery disaster. Um, uh, sorry about that. Yeah. So when you have a, a one, uh, 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 one of these uh, uh, Brownian bridges, then um, you can always still look at you know the excursion decompositions of the Brownian bridge. So you know if you when you have a Brownian bridge, you are splitting. The interval zero one into these excursion excursion intervals, and the structures of these excursion interval is an interesting one, of course. Uh, that uh, you know Pittman and Bertrand and Yor and uh, many others uh, like to play with. But if you condition once you have condition on how the these uh, intervals are there, then of course in, inside each of these excursion interval you are sampling an independent. You know, positive or negative excursion, standard Brownian excursion with that particular time length. And so, uh, in the two-dimensional setting, there's something similar, and there's something similar is the following: is that there exists 
you know, if I, you're giving yourself a Gaussian free field, then there's a way to define something that plays the role of, you know, uh, excursions away from, you know, uh, of the, the Gaussian free field. So you have this random, instead of here having this random, this partition of uh, the, the, the interval zero one into intervals. And of course, you know, a fractal set of times of dimension one half at which uh, the, the thing is equal to one. Then you are partitioning here that you are you are partitioning the the disk into you know disjoint uh, uh, you know uh, simply connected domains and then you know a very small piece which is not uh, in inside each of these domains which sort of plays the role of the zero set here of the the Brownian motion over there of the path here and then you have the following property which is that in each uh, of these uh, domains independently. Uh, the conditional distribution of the uh, Gaussian free field would be uh, independent and can be described in a very simple way. And the simple way in which this is described is that first you toss a coin to decide uh, if this is a positive, what you want to call it to a positive or negative expression. And once you did that, uh, so there's a particular number, lambda, which happens to be in that case equal to pi over two, just uh, that. Uh, and then Either it's positive and then you have two lambda or it's negative and you have minus two lambda. So it's a fair coin inside each of them. And then what you do is that in each of these domains, you sample an independent Gaussian free field with zero bounded condition to which you add the constant function plus two lambda or minus two lambda. And this sort of is the two dimensional analog of the, the, the the you know, excursion decomposition of uh, uh, Brownian motion or Brownian, uh, uh, or Brownian bridges. And of course, there are a number of features that one could comment on about uh, you know, that it's similar, but in some many sense, it's very different. But you see that this uh, you know, partition here, this sort of uh, this uh, way to split the domain into uh, this countable collection of uh, loops that we have here, which is called the conformal loop ensemble CLE4. And by the way, sort of this decomposition here is sort of due to uh, Miller and Sheffield. It's uh, not a very recent one uh, anymore, but uh, it's sort of uh, this excursion decomposition of, uh, you know, the Gaussian free field is in some sense the analog of, uh, you know, the excursion decomposition of the, of, uh, of the Brownian bridge, and therefore the splitting into these conformal loop ensembles CLE4 that we had defined before uh, of that you see here is in some sense exactly, you know, the, the sort of splitting analog, two-dimensional analog of the splitting of the interval zero one using the partitions that come out of uh, here, uh, of the uh, Brownian bridge. Now, what I want to explain, uh, the next step I want to explain is the following, is that when I have a Gaussian free field, sort of with these level lines, so let me just remove them. There's another uh, nice uh, random curve that you can define, which is a variant of the time of level lines that uh, I described with the, the, the before, which is uh, I pick a point, you, know, you pick two points, say A and B on the boundary, any one of them. So you can take, you know, minus I and I, and you have a Gaussian free field. And then you have a unique random curve that goes from A to B, can hit the boundary, but otherwise it's a simple curve, um, which has the property that conditionally on this curve, the law of the Gaussian free field will now on the, you know, would have boundary value Zero here would have boundary value lambda and minus lambda and zero here. So in some sense, this green line is a line along which, you know, that separates, you know, level lambda to minus lambda for the Gaussian free field. This is what is called a level line as, uh, you know, the level line defined by uh, Schramm and Sheffield uh, some time ago uh, for the Gaussian free field. And so these lines are of the same time than these loops that I had before, because in some sense, this loop, you know, the boundary condition inside was two lambda, 
And on the outside, things were all the loops were still balanced one half, one half with a plus lambda or two lambda or minus two lambda. So in some sense, the outside boundary value here along those loops was still zero. So you have this idea that here you have a you know the height, the gap between the value of the free field on one side and the value of a free field on the other side is two lambda. And so you have this uh, uh, height gap minus lambda lambda here as well. Okay. But now if you have this level line, you can also draw on the same picture all these, you know, uh, CLE4 here. So here is a CLE4 loop with height two lambda and they, some of them do intersect, happen to intersect this level line. Okay. And some of the loops with height minus two lambda do intersect the level line on the other side. I mean, it just happens to be this, that's the way it goes, right? So if you follow this green curve, you are going to hit along the way, bounce somehow along the way on some of these uh, zero two lambda or minus two lambda zero level lines of uh, the Gaussian free field along the way. And they will sort of, you know, oh, sorry, uh, that's the other color. They will be, you know, uh, densely, you know, uh, agglomerated on the left and on the right of the path that we have here. Okay. And for reasons that I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, don't have time to say much about now, it is actually very natural to now do the following procedure. What you're doing is that you define progressively this exploration path, so this level line here, uh, and each time you meet one of the CLE4 loops, say if it's one on the right, then you go, you trace this loop on the right here, and then you're back here, and then you continue along the trunk here, this level line here, and then maybe then you meet a loop that is on the left and you draw it. And then this green line will sort of, you know, bump into what it has done before, uh, but it will continue actually discovering all over the, all, all the time, new, uh, you know, CLE for loops in front of it. Okay. So there are, as always here, two ways to look at this, you know, dynamical picture, which is that either you draw the green path and then you go along the, the loop, you finish drawing the loop, and then you continue like this, you continue drawing this. So you concatenate all the loops, encountered loops, uh, one after the other, or you view the loops that you are discovering uh, as some sort of jumps, uh, you know, that they, when you, when the green process arrives here, you discover the entire purple loop at once. And this is very much reminiscent again, uh, of these sort of things having to do with excursion above infima and so on, uh, you know, uh, of uh, one dimensional paths that you can view, you know, either you're dis you know, viewing the entire path, you know, drawn progressively, or you view these excursions as, you know, appearing uh, in a Poisson point process fashion. Now, one very nice feature that we have here is, as I told you before, these, these loops are sort of agglomerated in a dense way on the trunk. And uh, they also, so they are sort of hiding the trunk, you know, they are sort of shielding the trunk away. And the boundary value of the field on the outside of those loops is always zero. So it's, it's always zero. So when you finish drawing one of those loops, then somehow the boundary conditions of the free field in the remaining to be discovered domain here, if you look at it, it's just zero everywhere because on the outside of the loop, the boundary condition is zero and uh, the, the trunk, the green trunk is hidden by all these loops. So you, it's not accessible. It won't affect the sort of uh, uh, what happens outside. And so you have a nice Markovian exploration uh, property over there. So um, now if you, if you look now at this picture, if you imagine that you define the same picture in the upper half plane, so, right, I, so I, now I'm drawing this um, green curve here, and then I, you know, I have discovered loops before on both sides. And now I'm, I'm in the process of having discovered a loop and drawing it like that. 
So you look at the path, the process, which is drawing all the loops that are encountered by this green level line one after the other. The natural way to encode this in our two-dimensional you know, uh, technology is via the Loewner driving function. And so what you're doing is that you're mapping out you know, the complement of what you are drawing here. So the red point here will be this driving function here. And this point here, which is the point that you are, is a special mark point that you have to target in order to go back here, is at zero. Um, and uh, is not zero, but it's what we call OT. Now, it turns out that, um, as we know from Loewner technology, if you know how this function psi of t evolves with time, you can reconstruct the curve. So the whole curve is characterized by what this function psi t is doing. What you know, and so you can find that in, in uh, you know, some papers with uh, Scott and uh, Jason, for instance, is that psi t minus ot, because you know that going from here to, you have to you know, complete this as a, 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 a SLE curve, that this process uh, has to be uh, necessarily um, a Brownian motion. So the difference between these two has to be a Brownian motion. Okay, so not going on, what's going right wrong here. Uh, the difference between those two is a Brownian motion. So let me try to cheat by using the, uh-oh. Ah, I know what's going on. Okay, uh, sorry about that. So what went wrong is that my pen uh, went out of battery. Okay, so so what you have is that you have uh, O here, and here you have Xi. So what happens is that Xi minus O in this uh, picture here has to move like a Brownian motion. On the other hand, you know that OT, when Xi minus O is positive, OT will move like the integral of one over Xi minus O. So this tells you that Xi is equal to Xi minus O, which is a Brownian motion, plus the integral of one over this Brownian motion. That's sort of what comes out of these, uh, you know, uh, Gaussian free field analysis of the story. So as a result, what you end up with is that Xi is going to be the sum of a Brownian motion necessarily, plus something that behaves like the integral of one over the Brownian motion when it's away from zero. So the outcome is that the only possible process is that Xi has to be the sum of a Brownian motion plus, well, this principal value of the integral of a one over the Brownian motion. So this principal value here of uh, 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 brown emotion that I alluded to before shows up here in a very natural way in the Loewner chain construction of the path that is obtained by concatenating you know these positive and negative excursions that you encounter one after the other along the, the green path that you have there. Now one thing you could do uh, which is a, a very nice variant is to do the following is instead of looking at the level line at uh, level, you know, the interface between lambda and minus lambda, then you can introduce the level line at height lambda plus C and minus lambda plus C. So the height gap is still equal to two lambda between what you have on the left and what you have on the right. It's still going to be a curve of that type. But now it's sort of a not left-right symmetric anymore, right? It tends to be, you know, if, if C is positive and smaller than lambda, so this works when C is between minus lambda and lambda, this is another uh, level line that you can describe. And that will be, you know, shifted, you know, it will tend, if C is positive, will tend to be a bit more to the right because it's, uh, uh, yeah, you, you leave the, you know, the two lambdas on the right, the minus two lambdas on the left. And uh, because you're looking at the level line at uh, size C, it will, you have some sort of shift there. But the same analysis still holds that if you draw this now new level line, which is not the left-right symmetric level line, and then you attach these loops, you know, the, the CLE4 loops to it in the same way, 
you still have that if you go all the way up to there, you have a left right, uh, you still have boundary uh, value zero. So what you end up here in the same analysis is that this time you end up again with a process psi, with a driving function psi that has to be of the type of a Brownian motion plus something that looks like the principal value of the Brownian motion here when it's away from uh, zero. But then we know it's not left right symmetric. What's the only option for this type of process is to add a constant mu. This mu has nothing to do with the, the, the excursion measure that we had before times the local time at zero of the Brownian motion. Here. Right, so now you end up with the fact that the, you know, something reminiscent of the fact that, you know, the only scale invariant, uh, you know, uh, the only uh, uh, stable processes with, a, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in one dimensions with alpha, uh, alpha equal one are, you know, Cauchy processes with linear drift. Well, then here you have this sort of two dimension incarnation of this property that says that you, you end up with a process which is driven by a Brownian motion plus the principal value of the integral, I mean, of the, this integral, and then you add a linear drift at zero. So the linear drift at zero is exactly telling you that this green curve, when it is in between the CLE four loops, you know, gets a little drift to the right or tends to have a drift to the right or to the left, depending on the sign of mu. And now there comes a, a natural question, which is, uh, what is in this picture here, the relation to, between the value of C and the value of mu, right? C here, you know, you start with the Gaussian free field, we define the green level line, you attach the loops and you get a random two dimensional curve, which you know by the result of Sheffield and Miller and myself from last year, that this is going to be of that type. Then the question is, what is the value of mu? Well, the value of mu, actually it's not from last year, that's in an earlier paper. What is the value of mu that you have here? Well, we don't really know what, what the relation between C and mu is because the way we identified this was just by saying, you know, it's a scale invariant process that scale like Brownian motion and uh, behaves like Brownian motion plus principal value of dt over uh, dt over t. And the only way you could do that was uh, to add a constant time to local time. Now there's a recent paper and it's a preprint by uh, Mattis, uh, Lim Kula, which uh, of course uh, Jean knows well because he's been a, a, I mean, he's a PhD student of mine who's been a driving force in all our uh, working groups in Zurich, which he's going to post on the archive uh, today or tomorrow. So you will either see it today or most likely on Monday, where the main result is just, well, mu is uh, pi times tangent of C. Remember lambda is pi over two. So, you know, C is between minus lambda and lambda. And this is a very, very simple looking formula which relates, you know, this uh, constant in front of local time here with the height of the Gaussian free field level line that you use in order to construct it. Now my time is running out very badly. I can see that. So I should say, I should uh, wrap up. So now, the proof of this result here is, is very elaborate. And, uh, uh, the, and it goes as follows. Uh, the core of, the, of, of his paper is actually a fine understanding when what happens to these principal values of integrals of vessel processes uh, of dimensions smaller than one. So the type of object that I showed you from Jean's old paper, uh, ancient 1990 paper. Uh, when delta goes to one and uh, to control in a rather fine way uh, this functional of the Bessel process when delta goes to one and a couple of other ones. And then uh, to use some uh, very recent result that I don't have time to explain here by uh, Jason Miller and myself, where we use sort of these, uh, exp we, we study exploration of conformal loop ensembles for kappa smaller than four, and uh, which are not related to the Gaussian free field. And the way we do that uh, is that hidden between the, behind these explorations that I've just you know, described to you here, that if you decorate these um, um, 
can form a loop ensemble with another additional independent structure involving Liouville quantum gravity, then you end up exactly, uh, you can show that some processes show up which are exactly Jean's growth fragmentation, self-similar growth fragmentation processes. So these growth fragmentation process of Jean, they are arising in an absolutely crucial way in this paper, I mean, in, in the, the paper with Jason and Scott here, which is the one in which, you know, a formula with tangent shows up that then uh, Mattis is able to take, take the limit of when delta goes to one. So, uh, so that's uh, the sort of story there. Now, I want to emphasize one thing because a number of you maybe in the audience are, uh, you know, knowledgeable about the co contributions by uh, many people in the audience themselves and Jean himself about understanding, you know, scaling limit of discrete planar maps. And it so happens that, you know, on the discrete level, uh, you have sort of analogs of the Markovian exploration, which are called uh, peeling processes. And uh, I just want to emphasize that the growth fragmentation process structures that arise there uh, that I just discussed are sort of the analog of what shows up in the scaling limit of random planar maps. And that's also why Jean has been involved. And if you look at recent papers of Jean, they have that with say Nicolas and Igor, uh, they have the type growth fragmentation and planar maps uh, in them. But uh, I just want to emphasize one thing, which is that this thing I've just be describing with the, the, you know, this type of exploration here, when you explore this with a continuous path and try to understand, you know, the fine structure of this value of mu, for instance, here, in some sense, this is something that has to do really with the embedding. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if, if you, for instance, would try to use, a, you know, a completely asymmetric uh, object here, you might end up with a process where you are actually, you know, where the, this green trunk, you know, goes around at infinite speed around the domain. And then the, the you know, the exploration that you have uh, when you look at the geometric picture, doesn't give rise to continuous green curve and a trunk. So here, the whole story of principal values here just arises because we're looking at an, an embedding of this growth fragmentation structure. Uh, and we sort of insist on the fact that we want this to be growing continuously along you know, some green trunk. So this is this story here in some sense is I don't think present uh, in the growth fragmentation structures that arise from the peeling processes uh, at the discrete level, at least uh, as far as I can tell. Okay, so I'm over time and I apologize very much about that. So I should probably uh, just uh, jump to uh, say happy birthday again, Jean. And um, uh, I wish uh, that we have uh, continue interacting and uh, uh, have, that I'll be able to benefit a lot uh, more in future years of your uh, uh, presence in our uh, community. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Wendelin. Uh, I suppose we have a time for just uh, one or two quick questions because, uh, so, yeah. Hi. Um, so I don't know if that's the uh, link that has been established uh, between the Gaussian free field and growth augmentations, but in the construction you presented with the the plus two minus two lambdas, uh, I was wondering whether by choosing a point in some way in the domain and looking at how, like the dislocations. I mean, let's say the domain has size. One, one, and uh, the point at some point uh, belongs to a smaller subdomain, so plus or minus two lambda. And if we look at the size of this domain in which the point remains, and the weight fragmentates into two pieces, mm -hmm. if this was a way to, uh, if there was a way to see this as a, a tagged particle in a gross fragmentation or something like that. 
Yes. So, I mean, the, the answer is uh, basically what happens is that um, uh, the answer is yes. So, but uh, it, you know, you have to, if, if you do that, you have to use uh, this additional, uh, you know, Liouville quantum gravity uh, idea. So when you want to go in the gross fragmentation world, you have to define these, you know, random area measures involving the Gaussian free field. So it's true that if you choose a point at random according to that measure uh, that is exactly the same as choosing a randomly tagged particle or random a random point on your random planar map. Um, but there, I, I think there's one thing that I want to really uh, insist because I think for many people this is a misleading uh, thing in the uh, which is that one very important thing in order to make the relation with the gross fragmentation processes a la Jean is that actually you have to look at the, you have to discover the structure using the appropriate sigma field. So what you are doing in practice in order to really see this gross fragmentation process is you have special glasses where you actually don't see the geometry of what you're discovering. So it's really misleading to say that we are exploring the CLE4 or, you know, the, 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 because actually what you are exploring, you know, the sigma fields that you have in order to have the real, you know, growth fragmentation process is just a sigma field that is generated by the observation of the jumps, you know, the length, the boundary lengths of the, 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 the loops that you are discovering, but you're actually not discovering the, the, the geometry of the loops themselves. So there's something, I, I mean, there are a lot of subtleties. On the other hand, I think it's fair to say that, the, you know, this question of putting tag point in a certain way in these type of exploration of conformal loop ensembles. Uh, I mean, this goes a long way. Uh, you can push it quite far. And so you have, for instance, a very recent paper by Shin Sun and uh, Ahn, Maurice Ahn, uh, I think on Monday or Tuesday on the archive, where they, I think it's called integrability of, of uh, conformal loop ensembles, where they sort of show that by doing this in appropriate way, if you choose three points suitably at random, you could sort of reconstruct things that have to do with uh, these, uh, you know, Rod Vargas, Kupiainen, uh, you know, construction of these uh, correlation function in the Gaussian free field. So this goes to give some sort of a geometric, you know, incarnation also of these integrability results on that side. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, let's uh, thank uh, Vendelin uh, again. Yeah, I, I should say I, I deeply apologize for always going over time and limiting the number of, <laughs> there with uh, limiting the number of questions. But uh, yeah, uh, that's just, yeah, uh, I, 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 I can't change myself. Uh, I, I'm doing my best. <laughs> you know, I, I, I read uh, some, some, I read an article yesterday, which said, um, or the day before, which said uh, that one typical example of different behavior of how men and women behave in science was that uh, the number of, of male, I mean, if you look at the proportion of male speakers who go over time without any worry, and you compare it to the number of female speakers who go over time without any worry, uh, there's a big, 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 big uh, difference. And so this made me feel totally ashamed uh, on the one hand, and on the other when I just encouraged Sylvie uh, which I see here on my little thing to go over time, please. Uh, so to, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thank you. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. It's very nice to see you all. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you, Wendelin. And so our next, uh, our next speaker is uh, Sylvie Miller from Ecole Polytechnique, and uh, she will speak about. Uh, um, population dynam dynamics and uh, in the context of climate change. Ça c'est bon. Ensuite, pointeur. Tu 
mettre le micro. Il est branché, non Oui, il est allumé. On va faire l'écran. Je vais Un écran ou lecture Ouais, ok. Ouais, ok. Ah bon, c'est bien. C'est bon, il y a le printer. Oui, so we are uh, very happy to have you. And, uh, <laughs> ok. So, uh, I am very happy to be here to celebrate Jean. And uh, so thank you to the organizer for the invitation. So uh, I, uh, as a Vendelin, I, I, <laughs> I remember very well uh, your arrival, Jean, in the laboratory in the famous corridor that uh, <laughs> 46, uh, 56, as uh, Eve explained on Monday. So we were with Sylvie Rolli in, the, in our office, which I think it was uh, the best office in the corridor because we had uh, repented here. It. Do you remember, uh, Eve, you told us that uh, it was uh, as a travel agency 